Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. All right, so today on the podcast, we have another guest reading, which is our favorite because we get to hear from all of our lovely friends, and then me and Zach don't have to record everything, which is also very fun. It's nice for the break. Recording is hard work. Yeah, recording is hard. Uh, We have Teddy Weinstein doing our guest reading today. Teddy was two years ahead of us at Windsor. We love him to absolute pieces, and he just started his LLM in health law at Ottawa, which is very exciting, and he was called in 2019. So shout out to Teddy. Thank you so much for doing this guest reading. We definitely appreciate it. And he is going to take us through Eldridge, which is another seminal Section 15 case. We actually ended up with a lot of Section Section 15 stuff uh, on the podcast, which is really great, honestly. I love Section 15. I find the decisions very interesting. And we've had a lot of them guest read, which is amazing because... Section 15 decisions tend to be very, very long, so they're always a taxing effort to read, and honestly, bless our guest readers for reading them, because it takes a while to read these things, but what do you know about Eldridge, Jack? I definitely remember covering Eldridge in first year con law, and that's about as far as my memory stretches for Eldridge, <laughs> because as much as I enjoy Section 15, it's never really been like my go-to section. I've always been like the Section 7, the Section 10, and the Section 8 yeah, stuff, yeah. all that all that crim stuff about like life, liberty, yeah, you're, security you're of the person. Yeah, you're a crim stand, don't yeah. worry. <laughs> but I do remember Eldridge. I remember spending a lot of time on it because I think it's one of those cases, as you said, seminal, but it's really important for us to grasp with, even if you want to just engage in a conversation about Section 15. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, don't worry. We forgive you your love of the criminal law. It's fine. Um, (laughs) No, Eldridge is good. So I love Eldridge because I actually can speak. So the decisions about discrimination against deaf persons uh, in BC, and I can speak ASL. So this decision was definitely appealing toward me to me, like sort of just personally. And then I read it and it was amazing. And I actually... No offense to the person who taught me first year con con law because I love him to absolute pieces, but I remember being very, very cranky because I loved this decision and we had a bunch of section 15 uh, decisions to talk about in class and we never got to this one. And I was so mad that I was just like, I wanted to flex my ASL (laughs) in front of my section and show everybody how smart I was. (laughs) All the things we do in first year law school. Oh, yeah, I know. It's like, oh, my God, it's so cringy I could die. But, yeah, no, uh, I love this decision. It's actually interesting because, you know, Section 15, uh, I it sort of lets you know that sometimes where the rubber hits the road, a legal decision doesn't really mean action in real life, even though you want it to. So, you know, the decision was about inact- like no access to ASL interpreters in a government program and you know i don't think they ended up getting them in the end right Mm -hmm. even even given the supreme court decision because sometimes there are other things that limit the ability to have stuff like monetary restrictions you know staffing restrictions what have you so it's interesting that sometimes you know you can find a charter violation and everyone can be like yep the charter was definitely violated but it's like Sometimes you just can't get the remedy you want. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, then what do we do, right? Like, where where do we go from here? And it's obviously I don't have the answers to any of these questions. But, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting stuff. What do you do when the rubber hits the road and you just you're not going to get the thing that you want? Yeah, that's such a good topic to talk about, too, because you're right. So we get these legal decisions and we get these seminal cases and we learn things and we understand how they legally apply. But like, let's be honest sometimes things are just legal fictions that exist in like the law writ large letters above us but how does that actually impact individuals on a day-to-day basis right can all these things happen can they not happen and like you said when the rubber hits the road like is there the money to do this kind of thing and where do you get the money from yeah. so it it almost transitions out of law into like political science policy discussions and politics Oh, yeah. And like, obviously, you know, we have our branches of government and there's checks and balances and all that stuff and all that is great stuff. But like, it can be hard for people, especially I know in the context of disability law, because it comes up a lot because, you know, a disability activist can get a decision that is 100 percent in their favor that will say, yes, your rights were violated. They should do X, Y, Z. And then the government entity that should do the thing just doesn't 
because there isn't the mm-hmm. political will to do it. And it's like, you know, it's messy. I feel like I say this every single time, but it's so messy. It's just like, you know, what are the limits of the law? And like, what is the law for? Yeah. And what in, what can the law do? Like, the law is not set up to ameliorate a problem like that, really. It's, it's no. more reactionary than anything. And it's, yeah, it's, Eldridge is a good example of, you know, it's excellent, excellent Section 15 jurisprudence. It's a very interesting decision. And the follow-up to what happens after Eldridge is equally as interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. With that, Teddy, take it away. Eldridge v. British Columbia Attorney General. 1997, Supreme Court of Canada. Citation, 1997, 3 SCR, 624. Judgment of the Court, delivered by Justice Laferre. This appeal raises the question of whether a provincial government's failure to provide funding for sign language interpreters for deaf persons when they receive medical services violates Section 15.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The appellants assert that, because of the communication barrier that exists between deaf persons and healthcare providers, they receive a lesser quality of medical services than hearing persons. The failure to pay for interpreters, they contend, infringes their right to equal benefit of the law without discrimination based on physical ability. Factual Background Medical care in British Columbia is delivered through two primary mechanisms. Hospital services are funded by the government through the Hospital Insurance Act, RSBC 1979, Chapter 180, now RSBC 1996, Chapter 204, which reimburses hospitals for the medically required services they provide to the public. Funding for medically required services delivered by doctors and other healthcare practitioners is provided by the province's medical services plan, which is established and regulated by the Medical and Healthcare Services Act SBC 1992 Chapter 76, now known as the Medicare Protection Act, RSBC 1996 Chapter 286. Neither of these programs pays for sign language interpretation for the deaf. Until 1990, the Western Institute for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, a private, non-profit agency, provided free medical interpreting deaf services for deaf people in the lower mainland of British Columbia. This program was funded entirely from private sources without any contribution from the provincial government. In September 1990, the Institute discontinued the service because it no longer had sufficient funds to pay for it. Prior to cancelling the program, the Institute made two requests of the Ministry of Health for funding. At the time, it had contracts with a number of government departments to provide sign language interpreters in connection with various services. The Institute requested similar funding for the provision of interpreters in the medical setting suggesting that sign language interpretation be covered as an insured benefit under the medical services plan. The first request was made in 1989 and it was declined out of hand. The second request was made in May 1990, after the Institute had decided that it could no longer fund the service. The cost of the proposed program, which would have extended through the province, was estimated to be $150,000 per year. The Ministry turned down the request on the basis that it would strain available resources and create a precedent for funding of similar services for the non-English speaking immigrant community. Each of the appellants was born deaf. Their preferred means of communication is sign language. They contend that the absence of interpreters impairs their ability to communicate with their doctors and other healthcare providers, and thus increases the risk of misdiagnosis and ineffectual treatment. One of the appellants, Robin Eldridge, suffers from a number of medical conditions, including diabetes. She sees a general physician and a specialist a number of times per year. Neither of these doctors know sign language. She has also been a patient in hospital on several occasions. The hospitals did not provide her with sign language interpreters. Prior to its termination, she used the Institute's free medical interpreting service. Subsequently, she hired an interpreter when she had surgery in hospital. She testified that she would continue to hire interpreters for important medical situations, but could not afford to hire one for every visit to the doctor or hospital. She finds visiting her doctors without an interpreter very stressful and confusing since, in her view, she cannot communicate adequately with them, 
Her specialist testified that he was satisfied with the level of communication when a sign language interpreter was present. In the absence of an interpreter, he explained, he was unsure about the accuracy of information conveyed by Miss Eldridge. Communication with her in these circumstances, he stated, was inhibited and frustrating. The other appellants, John and Linda Warren, see their doctor frequently. Although they had planned to hire an interpreter for the birth of their twin daughters, they were unable to procure one in time as the girls were born prematurely. Linda Warren testified that in the absence of an interpreter, the birth process was difficult to understand and frightening. During the birth, the nurse communicated to her through gestures that the heart rate of one of the babies had gone down. After the babies were born, they were immediately taken from her. Other than writing a note stating that they were fine, no one explained their condition to her. The Warren's physician, who does not know sign language, testified that communication by written notes is time-consuming, impractical, and has the potential to result in harm in some circumstances. Adequate communication, she related, is particularly critical for childbirth. If the doctor can communicate with the patient that the patient is able to help with the delivery, she explained, complications are less likely to occur and the patient is less apt to have a traumatic birth. In her view, writing notes is not effective in these circumstances. An interpreter is necessary for proper communication. At the time of the trial, the Warrens were expecting another child and wished to have an interpreter present at the birth. They stated that they would not be able to afford one for this purpose or for other visits to their doctor. At trial, the appellants adduced expert testimony explaining that many deaf persons are severely limited in their ability to read and write. The average deaf person, one expert related, has a grade 3 literacy level. Evidence was also led indicating that miscommunication between deaf persons and their doctors may lead to misdiagnosis. It was also noted that in Alberta and Manitoba, the provincial government funds interpreting services for the deaf, giving the highest priority to medical interpretation. The respondents presented evidence relating to the budgetary process of the Ministry of Health and the structure of the medical services plan. The government, witnesses explained, does not provide any services directly. Rather, it pays for the provision of medical services by the medical and health care practitioners on a fee-for-service basis. The plan covers most health services. However, there are a number of services that are not included or are funded only in part. These include the services of clinical psychologists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, nutritional counselors, and dentists. Moreover, the province does not pay for such medically related expenses as artificial limbs, hearing aids, or wheelchairs, and provides only limited funding for prescription drugs. Hospitals in British Columbia are funded through lump sum global payments that they are, for the most part, free to allocate as they see fit. They are rarely ordered by government to provide specific services. In those instances, they are generally required to fund the service out of their global budgets. The government does provide some funding for specific programs, such as heart transplantation, but this is infrequent. Judicial History The appellants filed an application in the Supreme Court of British Columbia seeking, inter alia, a declaration that the failure to provide sign language interpreters as an insured benefit under the Medical Services Plan violates Section 15.1 of the Charter. Tyso J. dismissed the application, 1992-75 BCLR 2nd 68, finding that this failure did not infringe Section 15.1. He determined that sign language interpretation is ancillary to medically required services in much the same way as is transportation to a doctor's office. Any disadvantage suffered by the deaf, he concluded, is not the result of the government's failure to provide such services, but is rather the result of a limitation that exists outside the legislation. In Tyso J's view, the Charter does not require governments to implement programs to assist disabled persons. If the government provides a benefit, he stated, Section 15.1 requires that be distributed equally. There is no obligation, however, to provide the benefit in the first place. He thus concluded that while it is desirable that deaf persons have interpreters for medical procedures, and that the cost be borne by society if they cannot afford to pay, Section 15.1 does not demand this result. On appeal to the British Columbia Court of Appeal, 1995, 7 BCLR 3rd, 156, the majority, Hollenrake and Cumming, JJA, held that the lack of interpreting services in hospitals is not discriminatory, 
because the Hospital Insurance Act does not provide any benefit of the law within the meaning of Section 15.1 of the Charter. Writing for the majority, Hollenrake J.A. noted that the extent of the services provided by each hospital is subject to its own decision as to how to spend the global grant received from government. The absence of interpreters, he thus found, results not from the legislation but rather from each hospital's budgetary discretion. Because hospitals are not, quote, government within the meaning of Section 32 of the Charter, he concluded, their failure to provide interpretation does not engage Section 15.1. He next determined that the Medical and Healthcare Services Act did not violate Section 15.1 of the Charter because it did not create a distinction between deaf and hearing persons. The proper approach to the application of adverse effects analysis to benefit conferring legislation, he added, was to focus on the impact of the legislation on the disadvantaged group. In considering this impact, he opined, a distinction must be drawn between effects attributable to the legislation and those that exist independently of it. In the absence of legislation, deaf people would be required to pay their doctors in addition to translators in order to receive equivalent medical services to hearing persons. The legislation removes the responsibility of both hearing and deaf persons to pay their physicians. The inequality resulting from the fact that the deaf remain responsible for the payment of translators, in his view, exists independently of the legislation. Thus, he concluded that the legislation provided the benefit of free medical services equally to the hearing and deaf populations. Lambert, J.A., in contrast, held that the legislation violated Section 15.1. He noted that many deaf patients, including the appellants, have difficulty communicating by writing. As a result, cases will arise where doctors will be unable to discharge the professional obligations without the aid of an interpreter. Because effective communication is an integral part of medical care, he concluded, sign language interpretation should not be considered a merely ancillary service. In his view, it is no answer to say that before the benefit was enacted, deaf persons were at a disadvantage and that this burden has not been increased by the provision of the benefit. The proper question is whether the law confers a benefit to which the disadvantaged group does not have the same access as others. He thus concluded that the Medical and Healthcare Services Act discriminated against the appellants where they seek to obtain medical services that require for the discharge of the practitioner's professional obligations effective communication between the practitioner and the patient, and where effective communication can only be achieved through the provision of translation services. Lambert J.A. found, however, that this infringement was justified under Section 1 of the Charter. He noted the Medical and Healthcare Services Act does not ensure comprehensive healthcare coverage. It does not provide for a number of products and services that are required by disabled persons, such as artificial limbs, hearing aids, and wheelchairs. In the allocation of scarce financial resources, he stated, governments must make choices about spending priorities. In these circumstances, he held, courts should defer to legislative policy and administrative expertise. Leave to appeal to this court was granted, 1996 to SCR 6, and the following constitutional questions were stated. 1. Does the definition of benefits in Section 1 of the Medicare Protection Act, SBC 1992, Chapter 76, infringe Section 15.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms by failing to include medical interpreter services for the deaf? If the answer to question 1 is yes, is the infringement demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society pursuant to Section 1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? 3. Does Section 3, 5, and 9 of the Hospital Insurance Act, RSBC 1979, Chapter 180, and the regulations enacted pursuant to Section 9 of that Act infringe Section 15.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms by failing to require that hospitals in the province of British Columbia provide medical interpreter services for the deaf? 4. If the answer to question 3 is yes, is the infringement demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society pursuant to Section 1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Issues There are four principal issues to be considered in this appeal. First, it must be determined whether, and in what manner, the Charter applies to the decision not to provide sign language interpreters for the deaf as part of the publicly funded scheme for the provision of medical care. Second, the court must decide whether this decision constitutes a prima facie violation of Section 15.1 of the Charter. Having found such a violation, 
it must be determined whether it is saved by Section 1. After concluding that it is not, an appropriate remedy must be crafted. Application of the Charter There are two distinct Charter, quote, application issues in this case. The first is to identify the precise source of the alleged 1651 violation. As I will develop later, in my view it is not the impugned legislation that potentially infringes the Charter, Rather, it is the actions of particular entities, hospitals and the Medical Services Commission, exercising discretion conferred by that legislation that does so. The second question is whether the Charter applies to those entities. In my view, the Charter applies to both, insofar as they both act pursuant to the powers granted to them by the statutes. I deal with each of these questions in turn. The Sources of the Alleged Charter Violations Section 32.1b of the Charter reads as follows. 32.1. This Charter applies b. to the legislature and government of each province in respect of all matters within the authority of the legislature of each province. There is no question, of course, that the Charter applies to provincial legislation. See RWDSU v. Dolphin Delivery Limited, 1986 to SCR 573. There are two ways, however, in which it can do so. First, legislation may be found to be unconstitutional on its face, because it violates a charter right and is not saved by Section 1. In such cases, the legislation will be invalid and the court compelled to declare it of no force or effect, pursuant to Section 52 of the Constitution Act, 1982. Secondly, the charter may be infringed not by the legislation itself, but by the actions of a delegated decision-maker in applying it. In such cases, the legislation remains valid, but a remedy for the unconstitutional action may be sought pursuant to Section 24.1 of the Charter. The Section 32 jurisprudence of this Court has for the most part focused on the first type of Charter violation. There is no doubt, however, that the Charter also applies to action taken under statutory authority. The rationale for this rule flows inexorably from the logical structure of Section 32. As Professor Hogg explains in its Constitutional Law of Canada, 3rd edition, 1992, Volume 1, at pages 34-8.3 and 34-9, action taken under statutory authority is valid only if it is within the scope of that authority. Since neither Parliament nor Legislature can itself pass in breach of the Charter, neither body can authorize action that would be in breach of the Charter. Thus, the limitations on statutory authority which are imposed by the Charter will flow down the chain of statutory authority and apply to regulations, bylaws, orders, decisions, and all other action, whether legislative, administrative, or judicial, which depend for its validity on statutory authority. The sentiment of Lord Atkin in speaking of a constitutional prohibition addressed solely at the legislative branch is also apposite. The Constitution, he wrote, is not to be mocked by substituting executive for legislative interference with freedom. C. James V. Cowan, 1932, A.C. 542, P.C. Australia, at page 558. The question in the present case, then, is whether the alleged breach of Section 15.1 arises from the impugned legislation itself or from the actions of entities exercising decision-making authority pursuant to that legislation. The proper framework for determining this question was set out by Lemaire J., as he then was, and approved by a majority of this court in Slate Communications Incorporated v. Davidson, 1989, 1 SCR 1038. In that case, the court was faced with determining the constitutionality of orders issued by an adjudicator under the Canadian Labour Code, RSC 1970, Chapter L-1, that were alleged to violate an employer's Section 2B right of freedom of expression. The Code endowed the adjudicator with a broad discretion to remedy the consequences of an unjust dismissal. There being no question that the Charter applied to the adjudicator, the only question was whether it was the legislation or the order that potentially infringed the Charter. In determining this question, Lemaire J., as he then was, stated that legislation conferring a discretion must be interpreted insofar as possible consistently with the Charter. He explained as follows at page 1078. As the Constitution is the supreme law of Canada, and any law that is inconsistent with its provisions is, to the extent of the inconsistency of no force or effect, it is impossible to interpret legislation conferring discretion as conferring a power to infringe the Charter, unless, of course, 
that power is expressly conferred or necessarily implied. Such an interpretation would require us to declare the legislation to be of no force or effect, unless it could be justified under Section 1. Although this court must not add anything to legislation or delete anything from it in order to make it consistent with the Charter, there is no doubt in my mind that it should also not interpret legislation that is open to more than one interpretation so as to make it inconsistent with the Charter and hence of no force or effect. Legislation conferring an imprecise discretion must therefore be interpreted as not allowing the Charter rights to be infringed. Accordingly, an adjudicator exercising the delegated powers does not have the power to make an order that will result in an infringement of the Charter, and he exceeds his discretion if he does so. Following this schema, it is necessary to decide whether the legislation impugned in the present appeal can be interpreted in conformity with the Charter. In Slate, it was clear that the legislation granted the adjudicator a broad discretion. It was thus easy to conclude that it did not, either expressly or by necessary implication, confer a power to infringe the Charter. In the present case, the task is more difficult. Indeed, in the court below, the argument proceeded on the basis that the legislation was under-inclusive, that violated Section 15.1 by failing to include medical interpreter services for the deaf in the definition of benefits in the case of the Medical and Healthcare Services Act, and General Hospital Services in the case of the Hospital Insurance Act. During the hearing before this court, however, counsel for the appellants proposed an alternative argument akin to the framework set out in Slate. She suggested that both statutes could be read to conform with Section 15.1. Under this theory, it is not the legislation that is constitutionally suspect, but rather the actions of delegated decision makers in applying it. In my view, this is the correct approach to the charter application issue in this case. In order to understand how I reach this conclusion, it is necessary to consider the statutory context of this appeal in some depth. With the exception of hospitals, which are the responsibility of the provinces by virtue of Section 927 of the Constitution Act, 1867, health is not a matter assigned slowly to one level of government. See Schneider v. The Queen, 1982, 2 SCR 112, at pages 141 to 42, per SDJ. It is generally agreed, however, that the hospital insurance and Medicare programs in force in this country come within the exclusive jurisdiction of the provinces under sections 927 hospitals, 9213 property and civil rights, and 9216 matters of a merely local or private nature. See Hogg, Supra, at page 6 to 16, at and the Canadian Bar Association Task Force on Healthcare, What's Law Got to Do With It? Healthcare Reform in Canada, 1994, at page 15. This has not prevented the federal parliament from playing a leading role in the provision of free universal medical care throughout the nation. It has done so by employing its inherent spending power to set national standards for provincial Medicare programs. The Canada Health Act, RSC 1985, Chapter C-16, requires the federal government to contribute to the funding of provincial health insurance programs provided they conform with certain specified criteria. The constitutionality of this kind of constitutional grant, I note parenthetically, was approved by this court in Reference Re Canada Assistance Plan, BC, 1991, 2 SCR 525 at page 567. The purpose of the act is set out in sections 3 and 4 as follows. Section 3. It is hereby declared that the primary objective of Canadian health care policy is to protect, promote, and restore the physical and mental well-being of residents in Canada, and to facilitate reasonable access to health services without financial or other barriers. Section 4. The purpose of this Act is to establish criteria and conditions in respect of insured health services and extended health care services provided under provincial law that must be met before a full cash contribution may be made. Sections 5 and 6 require the federal government to contribute to provincial insurance schemes where certain conditions are met. Section 5. Subject to this Act, as part of the Canada Health and Social Transfer, a full cash contribution is payable by Canada to each province for each fiscal year. Section 7. In order that a province may qualify for a full cash contribution referred to in Section 5 for a fiscal year, the health care insurance plan of the province must, throughout the fiscal year, satisfy the criteria described in sections 8 to 12 respecting the following matters. Public administration, comprehensiveness, 
universality, portability, and accessibility. The condition of comprehensiveness is of particular importance to this appeal. Its meaning is delineated in Section 9. Section 9. In order to satisfy the criterion respecting comprehensiveness, the healthcare insurance plan of a province must ensure all insured health services, underlined, provided by hospitals, medical practitioners, or dentists, and where the law of the province so permits similar or additional services rendered by other healthcare practitioners. Emphasis added. The phrase insured health services is defined in section 2 of the act to mean, inter alia, hospital services and physician services provided to insured persons. Hospital services are further described as having a number of specific services such as accommodation, nursing services, and access to diagnostic and treatment facilities, as long as such services are quote, medically necessary for the purpose of maintaining health, preventing disease, or diagnosing or treating an injury, illness, or disability, end quote. The definition of, quote, physician services, end quote, does not list any specific benefits. It states only that they consist of, quote, any medical required services rendered by medical practitioners, end quote. The act does not define the phrases, quote, medically necessary, end quote, or, quote, medically required, end quote. At the time of trial, the provision of medical treatment by doctors and other healthcare practitioners in British Columbia was governed by the Medical and Healthcare Services Act. It is now known as the Medicare Protection Act. Its structure accords with the criteria set out in the Canada Health Act. Section 6 and 8 of the Medical and Healthcare Services Act entitle residents of the province to the benefits provided by the Act. Section 6. 1. A resident who requires to be enrolled as a beneficiary on his or her behalf or on behalf of his or her spouse or children must apply to the Commission in the manner required by the Commission. 2. The Commission must, after determining that the applicant, the spouse of the applicant, and each of the applicant's children named in the application are residents, enroll as beneficiaries those covered by the application who are residents, effective not more than three months after the receipt of the application. Section 8.1. A beneficiary is, subject to Sections 9, 1, 10, 13, and 14, entitled to have payment made for a underlined benefit that he or she has received. In accordance with amounts in a payment schedule, less any applicable patient visit charge. Emphasis added. Quote, benefit, unquote, is defined in Section 1 of the Act as follows. 1. In this Act, quote, benefits, un end quote, means underlined medically required services rendered by a medical practitioner who is enrolled under Section 12, underlined, unless the services are determined under Section 4 by the Commission not to be benefits. B. Required services prescribed as benefits under Section 45 and rendered by a healthcare practitioner who is enrolled under Section 12, or C. Medically required services performed in accordance with protocols agreed to by the Commission, or on order of the referring practitioner, who is a member of a prescribed category of practitioner, in an approved diagnostic facility, or under the supervision of a medical practitioner who has been enrolled under Section 12, unless the services are determined under Section 4 by the Commission not to be benefits. Emphasis added. Notably, the Act does not list the services that are medically required, such that they qualify as benefits under the Act. With the exception of certain specialized services listed as insured services under the Medical Service Act regulations, BC Reg 144-68, Section 4.09, as amended, the legislation does not specify the benefits it provides. Section 4.04 of the regulations does expressly state, however, that certain services, such as those provided solely for legal, industrial, or insurance purposes, as well as telephone advice and cosmetic procedures, are not insured. Sign language interpretation is not included. In the usual course, the determination of what constitutes a benefit is left to the discretion of the Medical Services Commission, a nine-member panel composed of representatives from the government, the British Columbia Medical Association, and healthcare consumers. Pursuant to Section 4.1.J of the Act, the Commission is authorized to, quote, determine whether a service is a benefit or whether any matter is related to the rendering of a benefit, end quote.
Conversely, Section 41C empowers it to determine the services that are, quote, not benefits under the Act, end quote. The only limit on the Commission's discretion is set out in Section 4.2, which cautions that its powers must not be exercised in a manner that does not satisfy the criteria described in Section 7 of the Canada Health Act. Assuming that a failure to provide sign language interpreters in medical settings violates Section 15.1 of the Charter, in some circumstances, I do not see how the Medical and Healthcare Services Act can be interpreted as mandating that result. The legislation simply does not, either expressly or by necessary implication, prohibit the Medical Services Commission from determining that sign language interpretation is a medically required service, and hence a benefit under the Act. Indeed, the appellants assert in relation to the Section 15.1 issue that sign language interpretation, where it is necessary for effective communication, is integrally related to the provision of general medical services. Their theory, about which I will have more to say later, is that the failure to provide sign language interpreters violates Section 15.1 because it prevents deaf patients from benefiting equally from the provision of medical services in comparison to hearing patients. If this is correct, then the Charter demands that free sign language interpretation can be provided as part of any medical service offered to the general public, at least where the service requires a level of communication and that only an interpreter can ensure. Under this approach, the legislation must be interpreted to include sign language interpretation as a medically required service in these circumstances. It is clear, therefore, that the failure to provide expressly for sign language interpretation in the Medical and Healthcare Services Act does not violate Section 15.1 of the Charter. The Act does not list those services that are to be considered benefits. Instead, it delegates the power to make that determination to a subordinate authority. It is the decision of the authority that is constitutionally suspect, not the statute itself. I pause to emphasize that not every conferral of statutory discretion may be interpreted consistently with the Charter. Some grants of discretion will necessarily infringe Charter rights, notwithstanding that they do not expressly authorize that result. C, e.g., Re Ontario Film and Video Appreciation Society and Ontario Board of Censors, 1984, 5 DLR 4th, 766, Ontario Court of Appeal, affirming 1983, 147 DLR 3rd, 58, Ontario Divisional Court. In such cases, it will generally be the statute, and not its application that attracts Charter scrutiny. C. June M. Ross, quote, applying the Charter to discretionary authority, end quote. 1991, 29 Alta L. Rev. 382. In the present case, however, the discretion accorded to the Medical Services Commission to determine whether a service qualifies as a benefit does not necessarily or typically threaten the equality rights set out in Section 15.1 of the Charter. It is possible, of course, for the Commission to infringe these rights in the course of exercising its authority. That possibility, however, is incidental to the purpose of discretion, which is to ensure that all medically required services are paid for by the government. The situation is more complicated in the case of the Hospital Insurance Act. Section 3.1 of the Act states that every qualified person or beneficiary is entitled to receive the general hospital services provided for under this Act. Unlike the Medical and Health Care Services Act, the Hospital Insurance Act defines the services it provides with some precision. Mirroring the definition of, quote, hospital services, end quote, in the Canada Health Act, Section 5.1 of the Hospital Insurance Act describes the, quote, general hospital services, end quote, that are to be provided by acute hospitals as follows, bracket, equivalent provisions list services for extended care and outpatient facilities. Section 5. 1. The general hospital services provided under this Act are a. For qualified persons requiring treatment for acute illness or injury, the public ward accommodation, necessary operating and case room facilities, diagnostic or therapeutic x-ray and laboratory procedures, anesthetics, prescriptions, drugs, dressings, cast materials, and other services prescribed by regulation, but do not include d transportation to or from the hospital, e. services or treatment that the minister or person designated by him determines on a review of the medical evidence the qualified person does not require, or services or treatment for an illness or condition excluded by regulation of the general of the lieutenant governor and council.
It could be argued that by including a list of services to be provided in hospitals that does not include sign language interpretation, the Hospital Insurance Act implicates Section 15.1 of the Charter. In my view, however, it is preferable to read the Act in conformity with Section 15.1. Though the statute entitles beneficiaries to a specific list of services, hospitals are left with substantial discretion as to how to provide them. This discretion operates in two ways. First, it is clear from the regulations enacted pursuant to Section 29B of the Act that no individual hospital is required to offer all the services set out in Section 5.1. Those regulations state that the hospital services to be provided shall include such of the following services as are recommended by the intending physician and as are available in or through the hospital to which the person is admitted. Hospital Insurance Act Regulations, BC Reg 25-61, as amended, Sections 5.1, 5.7, and 5.8. Generally speaking, the promise does not fund specific procedures or services. Instead, it provides hospitals with a global lump sum payment intended to reimburse them for those listed services that they do in fact provide. This is clear from Section 10.1 of the Act, which reads as follows. 10.1. There shall be paid annually to every hospital from the hospital insurance fund a sum determined by the minister to reimburse the hospital in whole or in part for the cost of rendering to beneficiaries those general hospital services authorized by this act the hospital is required by the minister to provide for beneficiaries admitted for treatment, excluding those sums payable to the hospital under section 5.4 and section 14. As stated by the court below at page 168, Quote, the extent of the services to be provided by each hospital is thus subject to the hospital's own discretion as to how to spend the global grant they receive for general hospital services. Second, the Act gives individual hospitals considerable discretion as to the manner in which the services they decide to provide are delivered. Nothing in the legislation precludes them from supplying sign language interpreters. Hospitals have the authority, for example, to provide a sign language interpreter for a diagnostic x-ray procedure where one is required in order to ensure its efficacy. Like the Medicare Protection Act, moreover, the Hospital Insurance Act in Section 5.1d and regulations in Section 5.22 specifically list services such as transportation to or from hospital, in vitro fertilization, and cosmetic procedures that are not covered by the scheme. Sign language interpretation is not included in these lists. Consequently, the fact that the Hospital Insurance Act does not expressly mandate the provision of sign language interpretation does not render it constitutionally vulnerable. The Act does not, either expressly or by necessary implication, forbid hospitals from exercising their discretion in favor of providing sign language interpreters. Assuming the correctness of the appellant's Section 15.1 theory, the Hospital Insurance Act must thus be read so as to require the sign language interpretation be provided as part of the services offered by hospitals whenever necessary for effective communication. As in the case of the Medical and Healthcare Services Act, the potential violation of Section 15.1 inheres in the discretion wielded by a subordinate authority, not the legislation itself. The application of the Charter to the Medical Services Commission and Hospitals Having identified the sources of the alleged Section 15.1 violations, it remains to be considered whether the Charter actually applies to them. At first blush, this may seem to be a curious question. As I have discussed, it is a basic principle of constitutional theory that since legislatures may not enact laws that infringe the Charter, they cannot authorize or empower another person or entity to do so. Slate. Supra. It is possible, however, for a legislature to give authority to a body that is not subject to the Charter. Perhaps the clearest example of this is the power of incorporation. Private corporations are entirely creatures of statute. They have no power or authority that does not derive from the legislation that created them. The Charter does not apply to them, however, because legislatures have not entrusted them to implement specific government policies. Of course, governments may desire corporations to serve certain social and economic purposes and may adjust the terms of their existence in order to accord with these goals. Once brought into being, however, they are completely autonomous from the government, they are empowered to exercise only the same contractual and proprietary powers as are possessed by natural persons. As a result, while the legislation creating corporations is subject, subject to the Charter, corporations themselves are not, quote, government, end quote, for the purposes of Section 32 of the Charter.
Legislatures have created many other statutory entities, however, that are not as clearly autonomous from the government. They are myriad public or quasi-public institutions that may be independent from government in some respects, but in other respects may exercise delegated governmental powers or be otherwise responsible for the implementation of government policy. When it is alleged that an action of one of these bodies, and not the legislation that regulates them violates the Charter, it must be established that the entity in performing that particular action is part of government within the meaning of Section 32 of the Charter. Legislatures have created many other statutory entities, however, that are not as clearly autonomous from government. There are myriad public or quasi-public institutions that may be independent from government in some respects, but in other respects may exercise delegated governmental powers or be otherwise responsible for the implementation of government policy. When it is alleged that an action of one of these bodies, and not the legislation that regulates them, violates the Charter, it must be established that the entity, in performing that particular action, is part of, quote, government, within the meaning of Section 32 of the Charter. Perhaps the fullest discussion of the meaning of government in Section 32 is found in McKinney v. University of Guelph, 1990, 3 SCR 229, and its companion cases, Harrison v. University of British Columbia, 1990, 3 SCR 451, Stoffman v. Vancouver General Hospital, 1993 SCR 483, and Douglas slash Kwantlen Faculty Association v. Douglas College, 1993 SCR 570. There, this court was asked to decide whether the mandatory requirement policies adopted by certain institutions, in brackets, universities, colleges, and hospitals, in bracket, were subject to charter review. In confirming and elaborating upon the view taken by McIntyre J. in Dolphin Delivery, Supra, that the Charter applies only to Parliament, the provincial legislatures and entities that constitute part of the executive or administrative branches of government, and not to private activity, a majority of the court in McKinney, Harrison, and Stoffman found that Charter did not apply on the facts, since the institutions whose policies were impugned were not themselves part of the apparatus of government in the sense required by Section 32, nor were they putting into place a government program or acting in a governmental capacity in adopting those policies. In Douglas, however, the same majority found that the Charter did apply to the mandatory retirement policy at issue, on the ground that Douglas College was, in light of its constituent act, simply an emanation of government. I described the differences between McKinney and Harrison on the one hand, and Douglas on the other, at pages 584 to 585 of the latter case. Quote, as its constituent act makes clear, the college is a crown agency established by the government to implement government policy. Though the government may choose to permit the college board to exercise a measure of discretion, the simple fact that the board is not only appointed and removable at pleasure by the government, the government may at all times by law direct its operation. Briefly stated, it is simply part of the apparatus of government both in form and in fact. In carrying out its functions, therefore, the college is performing acts of government and I see no reason why this should not include its actions in dealing with persons it employs in performing these functions. Its status is wholly different from the universities in the companion case of McKinney and Harrison, which, though extensively regulated and funded by government, are essentially autonomous bodies. Accordingly, the actions of the college in the negotiation and administration of the collective agreement between the college and the association are those of the government for the purposes of Section 32 of the Charter. The Charter, therefore, applies to these activities. This Court's approach to Charter application was further elucidated in Levine v. Ontario Public Service Employees Union, 1991, 2SCR 211. There, the principal issue was whether a provision of a collective agreement compelling the appellant to pay union dues despite his non-membership in the respondent union violated the Charter guarantees of freedom of expression and association, insofar as the dues were being used to pay for specific political purposes chosen by the Union. In addressing whether that provision was subject to the Charter, I found for the majority that the appellant's employer, the Ontario Council of Regents for Colleges of Applied Arts and Technology, was, in virtue of the terms of the, its empowering act, an emanation of the provincial government. On this basis, I held that the Charter applied to the provision in question. Comparing the case to Douglas, I remarked as follows, at pages 311 to 12. Quote, Douglas, like the present appeal, involved a collective agreement between the college and the association, a union leader under the applicable legislation. 
There, the Minister of Education, by statute, exercised a degree of control over the College that closely matched that exercised by the Ministry over the Council in the present case. It is true that in Co Douglas, the College's Constituent Act expressly described it as an agent of the Crown, whereas here the Act simply gives the Minister power to conduct and govern the Colleges, and in this endeavour the Minister is to be assisted by the Council. But the reality is the same. The government, through the minister, has the same power of, quote, routine or regular control, end quote, to use the expression of the majority of this court in Harrison and Stoffman, companion cases to Douglas, end quote. In Douglas and Levine, the argument was made that even if the entities in question were generally part of, quote, government for the purposes of Section 32, the charter should not apply to the, quote, private or, quote, commercial engagement arrangements they engage in. In each case, the court rejected this contention, holding that when an entity is determined to be part of the fabric of government, the charter will apply to all its activities, including those that might in other circumstances be thought of as, quote, private. The rationale for this principle is obvious. Governments should not be permitted to evade their charter responsibilities by implementing policy through the vehicle of private arrangements. I put the matter thus in Levine at page 314. Quote, it was also argued that the Charter does not apply to government when it engages in activities that are quote, private, commercial, contractual, or non-public in nature, end quote. In my view, this argument must be rejected. In today's world, it is unrealistic to think of the relationship between those who govern and those who are governed solely in terms of the traditional lawmaker and law subject model. We no longer expect government to be simply a lawmaker in the traditional sense. We expect government to stimulate and preserve the community's economic and social welfare. In such circumstances, government activities which are in form commercial or private transactions are in reality expressions of government policy, be it the support of a particular region or industry, or the enhancement of Canada's overall international competitiveness. In this context, one has to ask, why, sh why should our concern that government conform to the principles set out in the Charter not extend to these aspects of its contemporary mandate. To say that the Charter is only concerned with government as lawmaker is to interpret our Constitution in light of an understanding of government that was long outdated even before the Charter was enacted. See also Douglas at page 585. While it is well established that the Charter applies to all the activities of government, whether or not these activities may be otherwise characterized as private, this court has also recognized that the Charter may apply to non-governmental entities in certain circumstances. See generally Robin Elliott, quote, Scope of the Charter's Application, end quote, 1993, 15 Advocates Q. 204, at pages 208 to 9. It has been suggested, for example, that the Charter will apply to a private entity when engaged in activities that can in some way be attributed to government. This possibility was contemplated in McKinney, where I stated the following at pages 273 to 74. Quote, Though the legislature may determine much of the environment in which universities operate, the reality is that they function as autonomous bodies within that environment. There may be situations in respect of specific activities where it can be fairly be said that a decision of that of the government or that the government sufficiently partakes in the decision as to make it an act of government. But there is nothing here to indicate any participation in the decision by the government and there is no statutory requirement imposing mandatory retirement on the universities." End quote. I commented further on as follows, at page 275, quote, I therefore conclude that the respondent universities do not form part of the government apparatus, so their actions as such do not fall within the ambit of charter, nor in establishing mandatory retirement for faculty and staff were they implementing a governmental policy. End quote. The idea that certain activities of non-governmental entities may be viewed as the responsibility of government was further elucidated in my reasons in Levine, where, after discussing McKinney, Harrison, Douglas, and Stoffman, I stated as follows at page 312. Quote, the majority in the above cases relied solely on the element of control in determining what fell within the apparatus of government. Although it made clear that government may in some circumstances be subject to charter scrutiny in respect of the activities in the private sector where the government could be said to have some responsibility for that activity." End quote. 
It seems clear, then, that a private entity may be subject to the Charter in respect of certain inherently governmental actions. The factors that might serve to ground a finding that an activity engaged in by a private entity is, quote, governmental in nature, do not readily admit of any a priori elucidation. McKinney makes it clear, however, that the Charter applies to private entities insofar as they act in furtherance of a specific governmental program or policy. In these circumstances, while it is a private actor that actually implements the program, it is government that retains responsibility for it. The rationale for this principle is readily apparent. Just as governments are not permitted to escape charter scrutiny by entering into commercial contracts or other private arrangements, they should not be allowed to evade their constitutional responsibilities by delegating the implementation of their policies and programs to private entities. In McKinney, I pointed to Slate, Supra, as an example of a situation where action taken in furtherance of a government policy was held to fall within the ambit of the Charter. I noted, at page 265, that the arbitrator in that case was, quote, part of the governmental administrative machinery for effecting the specific purpose of the statute, end quote. Quote, it would be strange, I wrote, if the legislature and the government could evade their charter responsibility by appointing a person to carry out the purposes of the statute. See item. Although the arbitrator in Slate was entirely a creature of statute and performed functions that were ex exclusively governmental, the same rationale applies to any entity charged with performing a governmental activity, even if the entity operates in other respects as a private actor. C. A. Ann McClellan and Bruce P. Elman, to whom does the Charter apply? Some recent cases on Section 32, 1986, 24 Ulta Law Review, 361, at page 371. Two important points must be made with respect to this principle. First, the mere fact that an entity performs what may loosely be termed a public function, or the fact that a particular activity may be described as public in nature, will not be sufficient to bring with it bring it within the purview of government for the purposes of Section 32 of the Charter. Thus, with specific reference to the distinction between the applicability of the Charter on the one hand and the susceptibility of public bodies to judicial review on the other, I stated as follows at page 268 of McKinney. Quote, it was not disputed that the universities are statutory bodies performing a public service. As such, they may be subjected to the judicial review of certain decisions. But this does not in itself make them part of government within the meaning of Section 32 of the Charter. In a word, the basis of the exercise of supervisory jurisdiction by the courts is not that the universities are government, but that they are public decision makers." End quote. In order for the Charter to apply to a private entity, it must be found to be implementing a specific governmental policy or program. As I stated further on in McKinney at page 269, quote, a public purpose test is simply inadequate, end quote, and, quote, is simply not the test mandated by Section 32, end quote. The second important point concerns the precise manner in which the Charter may be held to apply to a private entity. As the case law above makes clear, the Charter may be found to apply to an entity on one of the two bases. First, it may be determined that the entity is itself government for the purposes of Section 32. This involves an inquiry into whether the entity whose actions has given rise to the alleged charter breach can, either by its very nature or in virtue of the degree of governmental control exercised over it, properly be characterized as government within the meaning of Section 32 1. In such cases, all of the activities of the entity will be subject to the charter, regardless of whether the activity in which it is engaged could, if performed by a non-governmental actor, correctly be described as private. Second, an entity may be found to attract charter scrutiny with respect to a particular activity that can be ascribed to government. This demands into investigation not into the nature of the entity whose activity is impugned, but rather into the nature of the activity itself. In such cases, in other words, one must scrutinize the quality of the act at issue, rather than the quality of the actor. If the act is truly governmental in nature, for example, the implementation of a specific statutory scheme or a government program, the entity performing it will be subject to review under the Charter only in respect of that act and not its other private activity. In the present case, the controversy over the Charter's application centers on the question of hospitals. The respondents argue that if the failure to provide sign language interpreters does not flow from the act, but rather from the discretion of individual hospitals, 
and Section 15.1 is not engaged because the Charter does not apply to hospitals. Hospitals, they say, are not government for the purposes of Section 32 of the Charter. In their view, this result flows from a straightforward application of this court's decision in Stoffman, Supra. The foregoing analysis, however, establishes that it is not enough for the respondents to say that hospitals are not government for the purposes of Section 32 of the Charter. In Stoffman, the court found that the Vancouver General Hospital was not part of the apparatus of government, and that its adoption of a mandatory retirement policy did not implement a government policy. Stoffman made it clear that, as presently constituted, hospitals in British Columbia are non-governmental entities whose private activities are not subject to the Charter. It remains to be seen, however, whether hospitals effectively implement governmental policy in providing medical services under the Hospital Insurance Act. There is language in Stoffman that could be read as precluding the application of the Charter in the circumstances of the present case. There I wrote at page 516 that there can be no, there can be no question of the Vancouver Generals being held subject to the Charter on the ground that it performs a governmental function for the provision of a public service even if it is one as important as health care. It is not the kind of function which qualifies as a governmental function under Section 32. That statement, however, must be read in the context of the entire judgment. I determined that the fact that an entity performs a public function in the broad sense does not render it government for the purposes of Section 32, and specifically left open the possibility that the Charter could be applied to hospitals in different circumstances. Indeed, later in the same paragraph, I qualified my position in the following manner. Quote, I would also add that this is not the case for the application of the Charter to a specific act of an entity which is not generally bound by the Charter. The only specific connection between the actions of the Vancouver General in adopting and applying Regulation 5.04 and the actions of the Government of British Columbia was the requirement that Regulation 5.04 receive ministerial approval. In light of what I have said above in regard to this requirement, a, quote, more direct and a more precisely defined connection, to borrow McIntyre's phrase used in Dolphin Delivery, would have to be shown before I could conclude that the Charter applied on this ground, end quote. As this passage alludes to, the hospital's mandatory retirement policy, which was embodied in Medical Staff Regulation 5.04, was a matter of internal hospital management. Notwithstanding the requirement of ministerial approval, the regulation was developed, written, and adopted by hospital officials. It was not instigated by the government and did not reflect its mandatory retirement policy. Hospitals in British Columbia, moreover, exhibited a great variety in their approaches to retirement. That each of these policies obtained ministerial approval reflected the large measure of managerial autonomy accorded to hospitals in this area. The situation in the present appeal is very different. The purpose of the Hospital Insurance Act is to provide a particular services to the public. Although the benefits of that service are delivered and administered through private institutions, hospitals, it is the government and not hospitals that is responsible for defining both the content of the service to be delivered and the persons entitled to receive it. As previously noted, Section 3.1 states that every person eligible to receive benefits is, quote, entitled to receive the hospital services provided under this act, end quote. Section 5.1 defines general hospital services to include various acts normally available in hospitals. As the definition of hospital in Section 1 makes clear, moreover, hospitals are required to furnish the general hospital services specified in the act. While no single hospital makes all of these services available, the net effect of the act is to entitle every qualified person to receive and to require hospitals to supply a complete range of medically required hospital services. Indeed, if the legislature did not assure this, it would run afoul of the Canada Health Act. It is also apparent that while hospitals are funded on a lump sum and not a fee-for-service basis, they are not entirely free to spend this money as they choose. This is apparent from Section 10.1 of the Act, which mandates the annual payment of a sum, quote, determined by the minister to reimburse the hospital for the cost of rendering to beneficiaries those general hospital services authorized by this Act the hospital is required by the minister to provide for beneficiaries, as well as from Section 15.3c, which authorizes the minister to make payments to hospitals for the services provided under this Act and Section 
which provides that payments to a hospital for services rendered by it shall be deemed to be payment in full for the services. The structure of the Hospital Insurance Act reveals, therefore, that providing medically necessary services, hospitals carry out a specific governmental objective. The Act is not, as the respondents contend, simply a mechanism to prevent hospitals from charging for their services. Rather, it provides for the delivery of a comprehensive social program. Hospitals are merely the vehicles the legislature has chosen to deliver this program. It is clear that hospitals existed long before the statute and have historically provided a full range of medical services. In recent decades, however, healthcare, including that generally provided by hospitals, has become a keystone tenet of governmental policy. The interlocking federal-provincial Medicare system I have described entitles all Canadians to essential medical services without charge. Although this system has retained some of the trappings of the private insurance model from which it derived, it has come to resemble more closely a government service than an insurance scheme. See Canadian Bar Association Task Force on Healthcare, Supra, at page 9. Unlike Stoffman, then, in the present case, there is a direct, precisely defined connection between a specific government policy and the hospital's impugned conduct. The alleged discrimination, the failure to provide sign language interpretation, is intimately connected to the medical service delivery system instituted by the legislation. The provision of these services is not simply a matter of internal hospital management, it is an expression of government policy. Thus, while hospitals may be autonomous in their day-to-day -day operations, they act as agents for the government in providing the specific medical services set out in the act. The legislature, upon defining its objectives as guaranteeing access to a range of medical services, cannot evade its obligations under Section 15.1 of the Charter to provide those services without discrimination by appointing hospitals to carry out that objective. Insofar as they do so, hospitals must conform with the Charter. The case of the Medical Services Commission is more straightforward. It was not contested that the Charter applies to the Commission in exercising its power to determine whether a service is a benefit pursuant to Section 4.1 of the Medical and Healthcare Services Act. It is plain that in so doing, the Commission implements a governmental policy, namely, to ensure that all residents receive medically required services without charge. In lieu of setting out a comprehensive list of insured services in legislation, the government has delegated to the Commission the power to determine what constitutes a medically required service. There is no doubt, therefore, that in exercising this discretion, the Commission acts in governmental capacity and is thus subject to the Charter. As there is no need to do so, I refrain from commenting on whether the Commission might be considered part of government for other purposes. Having concluded that the Charter applies to the failure of hospitals and the Medical Services Commission to provide sign language interpreters, it remains to be determined whether the failure infringes the appellant's equality rights under Section 15.1 of the Charter. That provision states, 15.1, Every individual is equal before and under the law, and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law, without discrimination, and in particular, without discrimination based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. I emphasize at the outset that Section 15.1, like other Charter rights, is to be generously and purposefully interpreted. As Lord Wilberforce proclaimed in Minister of Home Affairs v. Fisher, 1980, AC 319, PC, Bermuda, at page 328, a constitution incorporating, incorporating a Bill of Rights calls for a generous interpretation avoiding what has been called the austerity of tabulated legalism suitable to give to individuals the full measure of the fundamental rights and freedoms referred to. See also Hunter v. Southam, at page 156. In the case of section 15.1, this court has stressed that it serves two distinct but related purposes. First, it expresses a commitment, deeply ingrained in our social, political, and legal culture, to the equal worth and human, human dignity of all persons. As McIntyre J. remarked in Andrews, at page 171, section 15.1, entails the promotion of a society in which all are secure in the knowledge that they are recognized at law as human beings equally deserving of concern, respect, and consideration." End quote. Secondly, it instantiates a desire to rectify and prevent discrimination against particular groups suffering social, political, and legal disadvantage in our society. See R. V. Turpin, 1989, 1 SCR 1296, at page 1333, per Wilson J.
See also Beverly McLaughlin, The Evolution of Equality, 1996, 54, Advocate 559, at page 564. While this court has confirmed that it is not necessary to show membership in a historically disadvantaged group in order to establish a Section 15.1 violation, the fact that a law draws a distinction on such a ground is an important indicium of discrimination. See Miron v. Trudel, 1995, 2 SCR 418, at paragraph 15, per Gonthier J. And at paragraphs 148 to 149, per McLaughlin J., and E and V Canada, 1995, 2 SCR 513, at paragraphs 59 to 61, per Leroy Dubé, J. As deaf persons, the appellants belong to an enumerated group under Section 15.1, the physically disabled. While this fact is not contested, it is nonetheless relevant. As Wilson J. Howell interpret, the determination of whether a law is discriminatory is a contextual exercise. It is important, she explained, at page 1331, to look not only at the impugned legislation, but also to the larger social, political, and legal context. It is an unfortunate truth that the history of disabled persons in Canada is largely one of exclusion and marginalization. Persons with disabilities have too often been excluded from the labor force, denied access to opportunities for social interaction and advancement, subjected to invidious stereotyping and relegated to institutions. See generally M. David Lepofsky, a report card on the Charter's guarantee of equality to persons with disabilities after 10 years. What progress? What prospects? 1997, 2 NJCL 263. This historical disadvantage has, has to a great extent been shaped and perpetuated by the notion that disability is an abnormality or flaw. As a result, Disabled persons have not generally been afforded the equal concern, respect, and consideration that Section 15.1 of the Charter demands. Instead, they have been subject to paternalistic attitudes of pity and charity, and their entrance to the social mainstream has been conditional upon their emulation of able-bodied norms. See Sandra A. Goundry and Yvonne Peters, Litigation for Disability Equality Rights, The Promises and the Pitfalls, 1994, at pages 5-6. to six. One consequence of these attitudes is the persistent social and economic disadvantage faced by the disabled. Statistics indicate that persons with disabilities, in comparison to non-disabled persons, have less education, are more likely to be outside the labor force, face much higher unemployment rates, and are concentrated at the lower end of the pay scale when employed. See Minister of Human Resources Department, Persons with Disabilities, a Supplementary Paper, 1994, at pages 3-4, to in Statistics Canada, a Portrait of Persons with Disabilities, 1995, at pages 46 to 49. Deaf persons have not escaped this general predicament. Although many of them resist the notion that deafness is an impairment and identify themselves as a member of a distinct community with its own language and culture, this does not justify their compelled exclusion from the opportunities and services designed for and otherwise available to the hearing population. For many hearing persons, the dominant perception of deafness is one of silence. This perception has perpetuated ignorance of the needs of deaf persons, and has resulted in a society that is for the most part organized as though everyone can hear. See generally, Oliver Sacks, Seeing Voices, A Journey into the World of the Deaf, 1989. Not surprisingly, therefore, the disadvantage experienced by deaf persons derives largely from barriers to communication with the hearing population. With this context in mind, I turn to the specific elements of the appellant's Section 15.1 claim. While this court has not adopted a uniform approach to Section 15.1, there is broad agreement on the general analytic framework. See Eaton v. Brandt County Board of Education, 1997, 1 SCR 241, at paragraph 62. Miron, Supra, and Egan, Supra. A person claiming a violation of Section 15.1 must first establish that, because of a distinction drawn between the claimant and others, the claimant has been denied equal protection or equal benefit of the law. Secondly, the claimant must show that the denial constitutes discrimination on the basis of one of the enumerated grounds listed in Section 15.1, or one analogous thereto. Before concluding that a distinction is discriminatory, some members of this court have held that it must be shown to be based on an irrelevant personal characteristic. See Miron, P. Gonth per Gonthi A.J., and Egan, per Lafaure A.J. Under this view, Section 15.1 will not be infringed unless the distinguished personal characteristic is irrelevant to the functional values underlying the law, provided that those values are not themselves discriminatory.
Others have suggested that relevance is only one factor to be considered in determining whether a distinction based on an enumerated or analogous ground is discriminatory. See Miron, per McLaughlin J. and Thibodeau v. Canada, 1995-2SCR627, per Corey and Yakabuchi J. In my view, in the present case, the same result is reached regardless of which of these approaches is applied, for similar reasoning. See Benner v. Canada, Secretary of State, 1997, 1SCR358, per Yakabuki J. for the court. There is no question that the distinction here is based on a personal characteristic that is irrelevant to the functional values underlying the healthcare system. These values consist of the promotion of health and the prevention and treatment of illness and disease, and the realization of those values through the vehicle of a publicly funded healthcare system. There could be no personal characteristic less relevant to these values than an individual's physical disability. The only question in this case, then, is whether the appellants have been afforded equal benefit of the law without discrimination within the meaning of Section 15.1 of the Charter. On its face, the Medicare system in British Columbia applies equally to the deaf and hearing populations. It does not make an explicit distinction based on disability by singling out deaf persons for different treatment. Both deaf and hearing persons are entitled to receive certain medical services free of charge. The appellants nevertheless contend the lack of funding for sign language interpreters renders them unable to benefit from this legislation to the same extent as hearing persons. Their claim, in their words, is one of adverse effects discrimination. This court has consistently held that Section 15.1 of the Charter protects against this type of discrimination. In Andrews, Supra, McIntyre J. found that factually neutral laws may be discriminatory. It must be recognized at once, he commented at page 164, that every difference in treatment between individuals under the law will not necessarily result in inequality, and, as well, that identical treatment may frequently produce serious inequality. See also Big M Drug Mart Limited, Supra, at page 347. Section 15.1, the court held, was intended to ensure a measure of substantive and not merely formal equality. As a corollary to this principle, this court has also concluded that a discriminatory purpose or intention is not a necessary condition of Section 15 violation. See Andrews at pages 173-74 to and Rodriguez v. British Columbia Attorney General, 1993, 3SCR 519, at pages 544-49, to per Lemaire C.J. See also the Ontario Human Rights Commission v. Simpson Sears, Limited at 1985, 2SCR 536, at page 547. A legal distinction need not be motivated by a desire to disadvantage an individual or a group in order to violate Section 15.1. It is sufficient if the effect of the legislation is to deny someone the equal protection or benefit of the law. As McIntyre J. stated in Andrews, at page 165, quote, to approach the ideal of full equality before and under the law, the main consideration must be the impact of the law on the individual or the group concerned." End quote. In this, the court has staked out a different path than the United States Supreme Court, which requires a discriminatory intent to, in order to ground an equal protection claim under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. See Washington, Mayor of Washington, D.C. v. Davies, 426 U.S. 229, 1976, Village of Arlington Heights v. Metropolitan Housing Development Corp., 429 U.S. 252, 1977, and Personal Administrator of Massachusetts v. Feeney, 442 U.S. 256, 1979. This court first addressed the concept of adverse discrimination in the context of provincial human rights legislation. In Simpsons Dash Sears, the court was faced with the question of whether a rule requiring employees to be available for work on Friday evenings and Saturdays discriminated against those observing a Saturday Sabbath. Though this rule was neutral on its face in that it applied equally to all employees, the court nevertheless found it discriminatory. Writing for the court, McIntyre J. commented as follows, at page 551, quote, A distinction must be made between what I would describe as direct discrimination and the concept already refer referred to as adverse effect discrimination in connection with employment. Direct discrimination occurs in this connection where an employer adopts a, practic a practice or rule which on its face discriminates on a prohibited ground. 
For example, no Catholics or no women or no blacks employed here. On the other hand, there is the concept of adverse effect discrimination. It arises where an employee or employer, for genuine business reasons, adopts a rule or standard which is on its face neutral and which will apply equally to all employees, but which has a discriminatory effect upon a prohibited ground on one employee or group of employees in that it imposes, because of some special characteristic of the employee or group, obligations, penalties, or restrictive conditions not imposed on other members of the workforce. See also Central Alberta Dairy Pool v. Alberta Human Rights Commission, 1990, 2 SCR 489, and Central Okanagan School District No. 23 v. Renaud, 1992, 2 SCR 970. I note that in Andrews, McIntyre J. made it clear that the equality principles developed by the court in human rights cases are equally applicable in Section 151 cases. This definition of adverse effects discrimination set out in Simpsons Dash Sears, moreover, has been expressly adopted in the context of Section 15.1. See Egan Supra at paragraph 138 per Corey J. Adverse effects discrimination is especially relevant in the case of disability. The government will rarely single out disabled persons for discriminatory treatment. More common are laws of general application that have a disparate impact on the disabled. This was recognized by the Chief Justice in his dissenting opinion in Rodriguez, Supra, where he held that the law criminalizing a distance su assisted suicide violated Section 15.1 of the Charter by discriminating on the basis of physical disability. There, a majority of the court determined, inter alia, that the law was saved by Section 1 of the Charter, assuming without deciding that it infringed Section 15.1. While I refrain from commenting on the correctness of the Chief Justice's conclusion on the application of Section 15.1 in that case, I endorse his general approach to the scope of that provision, which he set out as follows at page 549. Quote, Not only does Section 15.1 require the government to exercise greater caution in making express or direct distinctions based on personal characteristics, but legislation equally applicable to everyone is also capable of infringing the right to equality enshrined in that provision, and so of having to be justified in terms of Section 1. Even in imposing generally applicable provisions, the government must take into account differences which in fact exist between individuals and so far as possible ensure that the provisions adopted will not have a greater impact on certain classes of persons due to irrelevant personal characteristics than on the public as a whole. In other words, to promote the objective of the more equal society, Section 15.1 acts as a bar to the executive enacting provisions without taking into account their possible impact on already disadvantaged classes of persons." End quote. The court elaborated upon this principle in its recent decision in Eaton Supra. Although Eaton involved direct discrimination, Sopinka J. observed that in the case of disabled persons, it is often the failure to take into account the adverse effects of generally applicable laws that results in discrimination. He remarked at paragraph 66 to 67, quote, The principles that in not every distinction on a prohibited ground will constitute discrimination, and that in general distinctions based on presumed rather than actual characteristics are the hallmarks of discrimination, have particular significance when applied to physical and mental disability. Avoidance of discrimination on this ground will frequently require distinctions to be made taking into account the actual personal characteristics of disabled persons. In Andrews v. Law Society of British Columbia, 1989, 1SCR 1 143 at page 169, McIntyre J. stated that the accommodation of differences is the essence of true equality. This emphasizes that the purpose of Section 15.1 of the Charter is not only to prevent discrimination by the attribution of stereotypical characteristics to individuals, but also to ameliorate the position of groups within Canadian society who have suffered disadvantage by exclusion from mainstream society and has been the case with disabled persons. The principal object of certain of the prohibited grounds is the elimination of discrimination by the attribution of untrue characteristics based on stereotypical attitudes related to immutable conditions such as race or sex. In the case of disability, this is one of the objectives. The other equally important objective is to take into account 
the true characteristics of the group which act as headwinds to the enjoyment of society's benefits and to accommodate them. Exclusion from the mainstream of society results from the construction of the society based solely on mainstream attributes to which disabled persons will never be able to gain access. Whether it is the impossibility of success at a written test for a blind person, or the need for ramp access to a library, the discrimination does not lie in the attribution of untrue characteristics to the disabled individual. The blind person cannot see and the person in a wheelchair needs a ramp. Rather, it is the failure to make reasonable accommodation to find to society so that structures and assumptions do not result in the relegation and banishment of disabled persons from participation, which results in discrimination against them. The discrimination inquiry which uses the attribution of stereotypical characteristics reasoning as commonly understood is simply inappropriate here. It may be seen rather as a case of reverse stereotyping, which by not allowing for the condition of a disabled individual, ignores his or her disability and forces the individual to sink or swim within the mainstream environment. It is recognition of the actual characteristics and reasonable accommodation of these characteristics, which is the central purpose of Section 15.1 in relation to disability." End quote. Unlike in Simpsons, Dash, Sears, and Rodriguez, in the present case the adverse effects suffered by deaf persons stem not from the imposition of a burden not faced by the mainstream population, but rather from a failure to ensure that they benefit equally from a service offered to everyone. It is on this basis that the trial judge and the majority of the Court of Appeal found that the failure to provide medically regulated sign language interpretation was not discriminatory. Their analyses presuppose that there is a categorical distinction to be made between state-imposed burdens and benefits, and that the government is not obliged to ameliorate disadvantage that it is not helped to create or exacerbate. Before attempting to evaluate these assumptions, it will be helpful to relate the reasoning of the courts below in more detail. As previously noted, both the trial judge and the majority of the Court of Appeal determined that, while the access of deaf people to medical services is limited to a certain extent by the communication handicap, this limitation does not result from the denial of any benefit of the law within the meaning of Section 15.1 of the Charter. They were able to come to this conclusion because of the manner in which they characterized sign language interpretation. Interpretation services, they held, are not medically required. Rather, they are ancillary services, which, like other non-medical services such as transportation to a doctor's office or hospital, are not publicly funded. Having determined that sign language interpretation is a discrete, non-medical, ancillary service, the courts below were able to conclude that the appellants were not denied a benefit available to the hearing population. As the majority of the Court of Appeal explained, prior to the introduction of a universal Medicare system, deaf and hearing persons were each required to pay their doctors. When necessary for effective communication, deaf persons were also obliged to pay for sign language translators. The medical services plan, the court observed, removes the responsibility of both hearing and deaf persons to pay their physicians. Deaf persons, of course, remain responsible for the payment of translators in order to receive equivalent medical services as hearing persons, as they would be in the absence of the legislation. In the court's view, however, any resulting inequality exists independently of the benefit provided by the state. While this approach has a certain formal, logical coherence, in my view, it seriously mischaracterizes the practical reality of healthcare delivery. Effective communication is quite obviously an integral part of the provision of medical services. At trial, the appellants presented evidence that miscommunication can lead to misdiagnosis or a failure to follow a recommended treatment. This risk is particularly acute in emergency situations, as illustrated by the appellant Linda Warren's experience during the premature birth of her twin daughters. That adequate communication is essential to proper medical care is surely so incontrovertible that the court could, if necessary, take judicial notice of it. As Professor Pothier observes, for the hearing population, conversation between doctor and patient is so basic to the provision of medical services that it is taken for granted. See Diane Pothier, Mede, Mede, Section 15 of the Charter in Distress, 1996, 6 NJCL. 295 at page 335. The centrality of communication to the delivery of medical services is particularly evident in the context of negligence law. The duty of disclosure commands physicians to inform patients fully of the risks involved in treatment and answer their questions regarding such risks, 
C. Rival v. Hughes, 1980, 2 SCR 880 at page 884, and Hop v. Lepp, 1980, 2 SCR 192 at page 210. Physicians cannot discharge this obligation without being able to communicate effectively with their patients. In the absence of sign language interpretation, there may well be cases where it will be impossible for doctors to treat deaf persons without breaching their professional responsibilities. If there are circumstances in which deaf patients cannot communicate effectively with their doctors without an interpreter, how can it be said that they receive the same level of medical care as hearing persons? Those who hear do not receive communication as a distinct service. For them, an effective means of communication is routinely available, free of charge, as part of every healthcare service. In order to receive the same quality of care, deaf persons must bear the burden of paying for the means to communicate with their healthcare providers, despite the fact that the system is intended to make ability to pay irrelevant. Where it is necessary for effective communication, sign language interpretation should not therefore be viewed as an ancillary service. On the contrary, it is the means by which deaf persons may receive the same quality of medical care as the hearing population. Once it is accepted that effective communication is an indispensable component of the delivery of medical services, it becomes much more difficult to assert that the failure to ensure that deaf persons communicate effectively with their healthcare providers is not discriminatory. In their effort to persuade the court otherwise, the respondents and their supporting interveners maintain that Section 15.1 does not oblige governments to implement programs to alleviate disadvantages that exist independently of state action. Adverse effects only arise from benefit programs, they aver, when those programs exacerbate the disparities between the group claiming a Section 15.1 violation and the general population. They assert, in other words, the governments should be entitled to provide benefits to the general population without ensuring that disadvantaged members of society have the resources to take full advantage of those benefits. In my view, this position bespeaks a thin and impoverished version of Section 15.1. It is belied, more importantly, by the thrust of this Court's equality jurisprudence. It has been suggested that Section 15.1 of the Charter does not oblige the state to take positive actions, such as providing services to ameliorate the symptoms of systemic or general inequality, see Tibedo, Supra at paragraph 37, per Le Rodube J. Whether or not this is true in all cases, and I do not purport to decide the matter here, the question raised in the present case is of a wholly different order. This court has repeatedly held that once the state does provide a benefit, it is obliged to do so in a non-discriminatory manner. See Teto Gaduri v. Canada, Employment and Immigration Commission, 1991, 2 SCR 22, Hague v. Canada, Chief Electoral Officer, 1993 2 SCR 995 at pages 1041 to 42, Native Women's Association of Canada v. Canada, 1994 3 SCR 627 at page 655, and Miron, Supra. In many circumstances, this will require governments to take positive action, for example, by extending the scope of a benefit to a previously excluded class of persons, see Miron, Tetogaduri, and Schachter v. Canada, 1992, 2SCR 679. Moreover, it has been suggested that, in taking this sort of positive action, the government should not be the source of further inequality, Thibodeau, at paragraph 38, per Leroux Dubé, J. The same principle has been applied by this court in its interpretation of the inequality provisions of provincial human rights legislation. In Brooks v. Canada Safeway Limited, 1989-1 SCR 1219, the court found that an employer's accident and sickness insurance plan, which disentitled pregnant women from receiving benefits for any reason during a certain period, discriminated on the basis of pregnancy and hence sex. And so holding, it resoundingly rejected the reasoning of Bliss v. Attorney General of Canada, 1979-1 SCR 183 at page 190, which had held that the inequality resulting from a similar benefit program was, quote, not created by legislation, but by nature. In support of the view that the state has no obligation to remedy pre-existing disadvantage in providing benefits to the general population, the respondent relies on this court's decision in Symes v. Canada, 1993-4SCR-695. There, the appellant, a self-employed mother, 
argued that the wages paid to her nanny were business expenses and that the section of the Income Tax Act, RSC 1952, Chapter 148, that did not allow her to deduct the full cost of these expenses discriminated against her on the basis of sex. The court rejected this argument, holding that the distinction created between persons who incur child care expenses and those who do not is not related to sex, despite the fact that women are responsible for a disproportionate share of the social costs of child care. Writing for the majority, Yakabuchi J. held that the appellant had not proven that the actual expenses of childcare were borne disproportionately by women. He thus concluded that the appellant had not demonstrated an adverse effect that was created or contributed to by the legislation. He stated the following at pages 6, 764 to 65, quote, If the adverse effects analysis is to be coherent, it must not assume that statutory provision has an effect which is not proved. We must take care to distinguish between effects which are wholly caused or are contributed to by an impugned provision and those social circumstances which exist independently of such a provision. End quote. While this statement can be interpreted as supporting the notion that, in providing a benefit, the state is not required to eliminate any pre existing social disadvantage, it should be remembered that it was made in the context of determining whether the legislation made a distinction based on an enumerated or analogous ground. In Symes, the appellant was unable to show that the allegedly adverse effect created by the legislation was suffered by members of such a group. There was no relationship, in other words, between the benefit provided by the government and the social disadvantage suffered by women in child rearing. In the present case, in contrast, the alleged adverse effect is suffered by an enumerated group. The social disadvantage borne by the deaf is directly related to their inability to benefit equally from the service provided by the government. As a result, I do not believe that signs is helpful to the respondent. This court has consistently held, then, that discrimination can arise both from the adverse effects of rules of general application as well as from express distinctions flowing from the distribution of benefits. Given this state of affairs, I can think of no principled reason why it should not be possible to establish a claim of discrimination based on the adverse effects of a facially neutral benefit scheme. Section 15.1 expressly states, after all, that every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to the equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination. The provision makes no distinction between laws that impose unequal burdens and those that deny equal benefits. If we accept the concept of adverse effect discrimination, it seems inevitable, at least at the Section 15.1 stage of analysis, that the government will be required to take special measures to ensure that disadvantaged groups are able to benefit equally from government services. As I will develop below, if there are policy reasons in favor of limiting the government's responsibility to ameliorate disadvantage in the provision of benefits and services, those policies are more appropriately considered in determining whether any violation of Section 15.1 is saved by Section 1 of the Charter. The principle that discrimination can accrue from a failure to take positive steps to ensure that disadvantaged groups benefit equally from services offered to the general public is widely accepted in the human rights field. In Re Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission and Canadian Odeon Theatres Limited, 1985, 18 DLR 4th, 93, Saskatoon Court of Appeal, Leave to Appeal Refused, 1985, 1 SCR 6, the court found that the failure of a theatre to provide a disabled person a choice of place from which to view the film comparable to that offered by the general public was discriminatory. Similarly, in Howard v. University of British Columbia, 1993, 18 CHRRD-1353, it was held that the university was obligated to provide a deaf student with a sign language interpreter for his class. Without interpreters, the Human Rights Council held, at page D-358, the complainant did not have meaningful access to the service. And in Centre de la Communauté sur le Montreal Metropolitan Incorporated v. Régie de Logement, 1996, RJQ 1776, the Quebec Tribunal des droits de la personne determined that a rent review tribunal must accommodate a deaf litigant by providing sign language interpretation. Moreover, the principle underlying all of these cases was affirmed in Hague, Supra, where a majority of this court wrote at page 1041 that 
a government may be required to take positive steps to ensure the equality of people or groups who come within the scope of Section 15. It is also a cornerstone of human rights jurisprudence, of course, that the duty to take positive action to ensure that members of disadvantaged groups benefit equally from services offered to the general public is subject to the principle of reasonable accommodation. The obligation to make reasonable accommodation for those adversely affected by a facially neutral policy or rule extends only to the point of undue hardship. See Simpsons-Sears, Supra, and Central Alberta Dairy Pool, Supra. In my view, in Section 15.1 cases, this principle is best addressed as a component of the Section 1 analysis. Reasonable accommodation, in this context, is generally equivalent to the concept of reasonable limits. It should not be employed to restrict the ambit of Section 15.1. In my view, therefore, a failure of the Medical Services Commission and hospitals to provide sign language interpretation where it is necessary for effective communication constitutes a prima facie violation of the Section 15.1 rights of deaf persons. This failure denies them the equal benefit of the law and discriminates against them in comparison with hearing persons. I acknowledge that the standard I have set is a broad one. Given the nature of the evidentiary record before this court, however, it would not be appropriate to elaborate it in, in any detail. Some guidance can be provided, however, and I stress that it is guidance, not authoritative pronouncement, by the experience in the United States under the Rehabilitation Act, 29 U.S.C. Section 794, 1997, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, 42 U.S.C. Sections 12182 to 12189, 1997. Regulations enacted pursuant to these statutes require healthcare providers to supply appropriate auxiliary aids and services, including qualified sign language interpreters, to ensure effective communication with deaf persons. Code of Federal Regulations 45 CFR Section 84.52 C, 1997, 28 CFR Section 36.303 B and C, 1997. While the term effective communication is not defined by the legislation, it has been held to mean that a deaf individual actually understood the content of the communication. See Bonner v. Lewis, 857 F. 2nd, 559, 9th Circuit, 1988, at pages 563 to 64. One would suppose that it also entails that deaf persons be able to inform medical staff of the basic circumstances surrounding their illness or injury. See Elizabeth E. Chilton, Ensuring Effective Communication, the duty of healthcare providers to supply sign language interpreters for deaf patients, 1996, 47 Hastings LJ, 871, at page 883. This is not to say that sign language interpretation will have to be provided in every medical situation. The effective communication standard is a flexible one, and will take into consideration such factors as the complexity and importance of the information to be communicated, in the context in which the communications will take place, and the number of people involved. See 28 CFR section 35.160, 1997. For deaf persons with limited literary skills, however, it is probably fair to surmise that sign language interpretation will be required in most cases. See Chilton at page 886 and the many studies there cited. Finally, I note that it is not in strictness necessary to decide whether, according to the standard, the appellant's Section 15.1 rights were breached. This court has held that if claimants prove that the equality rights of members of the group to which they belong have been infringed, they do not need to establish a violation of their own particular rights. In Egan, Supra, the government contended that, given the net benefit available to them pursuant to other legislation, a homosexual couple was not negatively affected by the denial of a spousal allowance under the Old Age Security Act. RSC 1985, Chapter 0-9. In rejecting this submission, I commented as follows at paragraph 12. Quote, The respondent contends that the appellants have suffered no prejudice. I would simply dispose of this argument on the ground that, while this may be true in this specific instance, there is nothing to show that this is generally the case with homosexual couples, which is the point the respondent must establish. Similarly, Corey J. stated in Egan, at paragraph 153, that the appellants must demonstrate that homosexual couples in general 
are denied equal benefit of the law, not that they themselves are suffering a particular or unique denial of a benefit. That being said, it is fair to say that the absence of a publicly funded sign language interpretation service discriminated against the appellants by denying them the equal benefit of the British Columbia health care system. The evidence at trial established that, generally speaking, the quality of care received by the appellants was inferior to that available to hearing persons. Section 1 of the Charter I come now to possible justification under Section 1 of the Charter, which reads, 1. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. In order to justify a limitation of a charter right, the government must establish that the limit is prescribed by law and is reasonable in a free and democratic society. In R.V. Oaks 1986 1 SCR 103, this court set out the analytical framework for determining whether a law constitutes a reasonable limit on a charter right. A succinct restatement of that framework can be found in the reasons of Yakabuki J. in Egan at paragraph 182. First, the objective of the legislation must be pressing and substantial. Second, the means chosen to attain this legislative end must be reasonable and demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. In order to satisfy the second requirement, three criteria must be satisfied. 1. The rights violation must be rationally connected to the aim of the legislation. 2. The impugned provision must minimally impair the charter guarantee. And 3. There must be a proportionality between the effect of the measure and its objective, so that the attainment of the legislative goal is not outweighed by the abridgment of the right. In all Section 1 cases, the burden of proof is with the government to show on a balance of probabilities that the violation is justifiable." End quote. It is not necessary to consider each of these elements in this case. Assuming without deciding that the decision to not fund medical interpretation services for the deaf constitutes the limits prescribed by law, that the objective of this decision, controlling health care expenditures, is pressing and substantial, and that the decision is rationally connected to the objective, I find that does not constitute a minimum impairment of Section 15.1. This court has recently confirmed that the application of the Oaks test requires close attention to the context in which the imputed legislation operates. See Ross v. Brunswick School District No. 15, 1996, 1 SCR 825, at paragraph 78. The court has also found that where the legislation under consideration involves a balancing of competing interests and matters of social policy, the Oaks test should be applied flexibly, and not formally or mechanistically. See R. V. Keekstra, 1990, 3 SCR, 697, at page 737, among others. It is clear that while financial considerations alone may not justify charter infringements, Governments must be afforded wide latitude to determine the proper distribution of resources in society. See McKinney at page 288 and Egan at paragraph 184 per Sapinka J. This is especially true where Parliament, in providing specific social benefits, has to choose between disadvantaged groups. See Egan at paragraphs 105 to 110 per Sapinka J. On the other hand, Members of this court have suggested that deference should not be accorded to the legislature merely because an issue is a social one, or because a need for governmental incrementalism is shown. See Egan at paragraph 97 per Leroux du Béjé, and at paragraphs 215 to 16 per Yakabuchi J. In the present case, the failure to provide sign language interpreters would fail minimal impairment breach of the Oaks test under a deferential approach. It is therefore unnecessary to decide whether in this social benefits context, where the choice is between the needs of general population and those of a disadvantaged group, a deferential approach should be adopted. At the same time, the leeway to be granted to the state is not infinite. Governments must demonstrate that their actions infringe the rights in question no more than is reasonably necessary to achieve their goals. Thus, I state the following for the court in Tetro Gaduri, Supra, at page 44. It should go without saying, however, that the deference will be accorded to the government where legislating in these matters does not give them an unrestricted license to disregard an individual's charter rights. Where the government cannot show that it has a reasonable basis for concluding that it has complied with the requirement of minimal impairment is seeking to attain its objectives, the legislation will be struck down. In the present case, the government has manifestly failed to demonstrate that as a reasonable basis for concluding 
that total denial of medical interpretation services for the deaf constituted the minimum impairment of their rights. As previously noted, the estimated cost of providing sign language interpretation for the whole of British Columbia was only $150,000, or approximately 0.0025% of the provincial healthcare budget at the time. This figure is based on an extrapolation from the services then being provided by the Western Institute for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in the Lower Mainland area. Although there was little evidence presented of the precise content of this service, it was not suggested that its extension throughout the province would have fulfilled the requirements of Section 15.1. In these circumstances, the refusal to expend such a relatively insignificant sum to continue and extend the service cannot possibly constitute the minimum impairment of the appellant's constitutional rights. The respondents argue, however, that the situation of deaf persons cannot be meaningfully distinguished from that of other non-official language speakers. If they are compelled to provide interpreters for the former they submit, they will also have to do so for the latter, thereby increasing the expense of the program dramatically and placing severe strain on the fiscal sustainability of the healthcare system. In this context, they contend, it was reasonable for the government to conclude that they impaired the rights of deaf persons as little as possible. This argument, in my view, is purely speculative. It is by no means clear that deaf persons and non-official language speakers are in a similar position, either in terms of their constitutional status or their practical access to adequate health care. From the perspective of a patient, there is no real difference between sign language and oral language if there is no ability to communicate with a physician. But from the perspective of the state's obligations, there may very well be. In the present case, the only relevant constitutional provisions are sections 15.1 and 1 of the Charter. In a case involving a claim for medical interpretation for hearing patients, in contrast, the analysis would be more complicated. In such a case, it would be necessary to consider the interaction between section 15.1 and other provisions of the Constitution, specifically those related to the language obligations of governments. Moreover, the respondents have presented no evidence as to the potential scope or cost of an oral language medical interpretation program. It is possible that the nature and extent of any reasonable accommodation required for hearing persons under Section 1 would differ from that required for deaf persons. Thus, any claim for the provision of such a program, whether based on national origin or language as an analogous ground, would proceed on markedly different constitutional terrain than a claim grounded on disability. Further, it is apparent that deaf persons stand in a special position in terms of their ability to communicate with the mainstream population. As I have discussed, it is extremely difficult for many deaf persons to acquire a high level of proficiency in oral languages, whether in spoken or written form. Moreover, it is apparent that the deaf have particular difficulties in obtaining the service of persons in the community who understand sign language. There is no evidentiary basis from which to assess whether non-official language speakers stand in a similar position. So without wishing to minimize the difficulties faced by hearing persons whose native tongues are neither English nor French, it is by no means clear that the communications barriers they face are analogous to those encountered by deaf persons. As a result, the success of a potential Section 15.1 claim by members of the latter group cannot be predicted in advance. The possibility that such a claim might be made, therefore, cannot justify the infringement of the constitutional rights of the deaf. The respondents also contend that recognition of the appellate's claim will have a ripple effect throughout the healthcare field, forcing governments to spend precious healthcare dollars accommodating the needs of myriad disadvantaged persons. Virtually everyone in the healthcare system who is denied a service, they submit, will either be medically disadvantaged or could argue that a medical disadvantage will arise from the lack of service. Similarly, in his concurring opinion on the Court of Appeal, Lambert J. A. observed that many of the medical services and products acquired by the disabled are not publicly funded. In these circumstances, he asserted, governments must have the freedom to allocate scarce health care dollars among various disadvantaged groups. These arguments miss the mark. If effective communication is integrally connected with the provision of health care, a point Lambert J. A. accepted, then the fact that there are a number of medical services that benefit disabled persons that are not covered by Medicare is immaterial. The appellants do not demand that the government provide them with a discrete service or product, such as hearing aids, that will help alleviate their general disadvantage. Their claim is not for a benefit that the government, in the access of its discretion to allocate resources to address various social problems, has chosen not to provide. On the contrary, 
They ask only for equal access to services that are available to all. The respondents have presented no evidence that this kind of accommodation, if extended to other government services, will unduly strain the fiscal resources of the state. To deny the appellant's claim on such conjectural grounds, in my view, would denude Section 15.1 of its egalitarian purpose and render the disabled's goal of a barrier-free society distressingly remote. Viewed in this light, it is impossible to characterize the government's decision not to fund a sign language interpretation as one which reasonably balances the competing social demands in which society must address. See McKinney, Supra, page 314. It should be recalled that the Ministry of Health decided not to fund the interpretation program even in part. Other options, such as the partial or interim funding of the program offered by Western Institutes for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, or the institution of a scheme requiring users to pay either a portion of the cost of interpreters or the full amount if they could afford to do so, were either not considered or were considered and rejected. In this case, the present case is similar to Tetro Gaduri Supra, where the court found that the denial of unemployment insurance benefits to persons over 65 violated Section 15.1 and could not be saved under Section 1 of the Charter. Writing for the court, I found that one of the reasons that this denial failed the minimal impairment test was that persons over 65 were not entitled to any benefits. Even allowing the government a healthy measure of flexibility in legislating in this area, I stated at page 47, the complete denial of unemployment benefits is not an acceptable method of achieving any of the government objectives set forth above. That said, I do not wish to be understood as intim intimating that the alternative measures I have averted would survive Section 1 scrutiny. I refer to them solely for the purpose of demonstrating that the government did not attempt to institute a scheme that would cons constitute a lesser limitation on deaf persons' rights. In summary, I am of the view that the failure to fund sign language interpretation is not a minimal impairment of Section 15 rights of deaf persons to equal benefit of the law without discrimination on the basis of their physical disability. The evidence clearly demonstrates that, as a class, deaf persons receive medical services that are inferior to those received by the hearing population. Given the central place of good health and the quality of life of all persons in our society, the provision of substandard medical services to the deaf necessarily diminishes the overall quality of their lives. The government has simply not demonstrated that this unprofitous state of affairs must be tolerated in order to achieve the objective of limiting health care expenditures. Stated differently, the government has not made a reasonable accommodation of the appellant's disability. In the language of this court's human rights jurisprudence, it has not accommodated the appellant's needs to the point of undue hardship, see Simpsons-Sears, Supra, and Central Alberta Dairy Pool, Supra. Remedy I have found that where sign language interpreters are necessary for effective communication in the delivery of medical services, the failure to provide them constitutes a denial of Section 15.1 of the Charter and is not a reasonable limit under Section 1. Section 24.1 of the Charter provides that anyone whose rights under the Charter have been infringed or denied may obtain such remedy as the Court considers appropriate and just in the circumstances. In the present case, the appropriate and just remedy to grant a declaration that this failure is unconstitutional and to direct the government of British Columbia to administer the Health and Medical Care Services Act, now the Medicare Protection Act, and the Hospital Insurance Act in the manner consistent with the requirements of Section 15.1 as I have described them. A declaration, as opposed to some kind of injunctive relief, is the appropriate remedy in this case because there are myriad options available to the government that may rectify the unconstitutionality of the current system. It is not this court's role to dictate how this is to be accomplished. Although it is to be assumed that the government will move swiftly to correct the unconstitutionality of the present scheme and comply with this court's directive, it is appropriate to suspend the effectiveness of the declaration for six months to enable the government to explore its options and formulate an appropriate response. In fashioning its response, the government should ensure that, after the expiration of six months or any other period of suspension granted by this court, sign language interpreters will be provided where necessary for effective communication in the delivery of medical services. Moreover, it is presumed that the government will act in good faith by considering not only the role of hospitals in the delivery of medical services, but also the involvement of the Medical Services Commission and the Ministry of Health. This position. I would allow the appeal. Costs are awarded to the appellants from the respondents throughout. I would answer the following constitutional questions as follows. 1. 
Does the definition of benefits in Section 1 of the Medicare Protection Act, SBC 1992, Chapter 76, infringe Section 15.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms by failing to include medical interpreter services for the deaf? No. 2. If the answer to question 1 is yes, is the infringement demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society to Section 1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Given my response to question 1, it is not necessary to consider this question. 3. Do sections 3, 5, and 9 of the Hospital Insurance Act, RSBC 1979, Chapter 180, and the regulations enacted pursuant to section 9 of that Act, infringe section 15, 1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms by failing to require that hospitals in the province of British Columbia provide medical interpreter services for the deaf? No. 4. If the answer to question 3 is yes, is the infringement demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society pursuant to Section 1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Given my response to question 3, it is not necessary to consider this question. Appeal allowed with costs. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at LegalListening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.